So good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone who have logged into this this expert webinar for today. Uh, our webinar uh, session for today is going to focus on PUFA in pregnancy and early life. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to to introduce you to uh, to the international and national panel of experts who are uh, presiding on this webinar. This webinar is also going to discuss data from COPSAC, the inflammatory response, and newer learnings from COVID. And uh, thank you so much that with so much of so many things going around uh, and uh, uh, with with a crisis situation uh, that we are dealing with, uh, we have so many participants on online, and we are very happy to receive you all. And also, I would thank like you. to take uh, take my take this opportunity to thank the panelists from the bottom of our hearts for their contribution in taking care of uh, many many lives and being the frontliners in this time of crisis. They really are warriors and I'm going to salute everyone uh, on the panel and everyone in the fraternity. So let me quickly introduce you to the panelists for today. We have Dr. Abha. The world knows Dr. Abha Mazumdar and she is a key member of the team responsible for North India's very first IVF baby in 1991 with a wide field of interest that includes infertility assisted reproductive techniques, reproductive endocrinology, and endoscopic surgery for pelvic resurrection. Dr. Mahindra has over 40 years of experience, authored more than 10 book chapters, and a remarkable feat in the field of infertility treatment. Thank you so much for joining in, Dr. Abha. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Hans. Dr. Hans Bisgard, who's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Copenhagen. He's the founder and head of the Copenhagen Prospective Studies on Asthma in Childhood, which is COPSAC. Dr. Hans Bisgard is the founder and head uh, of, uh, at, at the Gentoff Hospital, University of Copenhagen. He's been awarded the prestigious 2019 Novo Prize for his pioneering research in understanding how asthma and other inflammatory diseases have early origins. And in fact, he considers his mission to understand the origin of these diseases and has dedicated his practice to translating his research into clinical practice. Thank you so much, Dr. Hans, for joining in from the other part of the world. Uh, Professor Meenu, is our, uh, Meenu Singh uh, is the next panelist I would like to introduce, and it's my pleasure to introduce ma'am, who is also a moderator on this session. She is the leading researcher in asthma and tuberculosis and cystic fibrosis in children. Under her able guidance, the National Task Force of ICMR on the role of BCG in childhood allergy and asthma has seen commendable performance. She's currently Chief of Pediatric Pulmonology at the Advanced Pediatric Center, PGI Chandigarh. And she's also the Principal Investigator for the ICMR Center for Advanced Research in Evidence-Based Medicine. She's heading the Telemedicine Department at PGI uh, Chandigarh. Uh, next, I have, uh, and again, my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. and Professor Sunita Mittal. She's the ex head, to head of the department AIMS, the, the premier medical college in India and has done path-breaking national international research in women's health. Armed with an experience of more than 42 years, her work in the field of obstetrics and gynecology led to the introduction of emergency contraception and medical abortion in India. She has a number of initiatives for safe motherhood in India to her credit. Thank you, ma'am, for joining in. We have um, the last finalist I'm going to be introducing uh, is going to be Dr. Ruma Sinha, she is an honorary professor, Apollo Hospitals, uh, taking care of the Educational Research Foundation. She's an associate professor at Macquarie University of Sydney, Australia, and a consultant gynecologist, laparoscopic and robotic surgeon, lead faculty, fe and also fellowships in minimal access and robotic surgery, Apollo Health City, Hyderabad. She has uh, 25 years of rich experience in minimal access surgery, has authored 20 papers and 15 chapters, and has been recognized as a legend in the field of gynecology as Times Healthcare Achievers 2017. And it's so much my pleasure to introduce uh, the expert and the, and the most eminent panelists that I can have today. And going on to uh, our first presentation of the evening, I would like to, uh, uh, to request uh, Dr. Abha, 
uh, to take ahead the, uh, the next uh, uh, session and which is going to be on PUFA, going back to the basics of cut immunity. Ma'am, uh, we'll pass on the controls to you. You can uh, start your presentation. Thank you, Rasika, for the great introduction. Good evening to all my colleagues, all the delegates who have joined today. It is indeed uh, my privilege to be addressing you on this topic, which I read after I started you know, to know a little bit about it. And as the first slide goes, right. The first question which comes to my audience mind as it came to mind is what is PUFA? So in today's polluted and contaminated environment where the viruses are everywhere and are here to stay, I think the only thing we today talk about is development of one's immune system of, and it is of vital importance. And here comes the role of PUFA, probably for us as humans and for our little baby whom we are very tenderly taken care of in our uteruses. Now, what is the role of PUFA? We have to understand that PUFA is polyunsaturated fatty acids, which could be um, omega-3 or omega-6 fatty acids. However, two of these are very, very important. And one is eicosa pentanoic acid and docosa hexanoic acid, very commonly known as EPA and DHA. The human body does not produce these uh, uh, fatty acids. This is only available through nutrition. Vegetarians also have a lot of this from nuts and seeds and maybe milk dairy product, but it is a very, very small amount. Fish and shellfish and the fish, which is the crustarians, which are at the bottom of the sea, are a big source of these, uh, this PUFA. And um, in the last three years, over 5,000 papers have been published on gut microbiota and immunity. So how do I jump to gut microbiota? PUFA or polysaturated, uh, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which we take orally, especially the mothers who are carrying a baby when they take it orally, then this goes into the maternal system. From there, it goes to the gut of the baby and it modulates the gut myo microbiota and that microbiota develops immunity in the newborn child especially for the first 28 days so this is the biggest role what PUFA has in a pregnant mother when we uh, sort of give her a high dose which can pass off to the baby through the placenta and then reach the uh, modulate the microbiota in the baby's gut and cause gut immunity. But here we are not talking about PUFA and the baby's uh, immunity only. We are talking of many more things. We say it prevents preterm labor. It also causes a lot of developmental, um, it aids development of the neurological system of the brain. But no, we are talking about the respiratory system here. And new research shows a direct crosstalk between early life gut microbiota and development of lung immunity against pneumonias, especially viral pneumonias. And um, on the other hand, if the gut microbiota of the fetus is unhealthy, the maternal nutrition affects this gut microbiota of the fetus. And if the nutrients are different, are unhealthy, then the gut microbiota of the fetus also would have the same. And then what happens? It weakens the lung macrophages, or I would say immunity cells. Immune cells of the lungs become weakened, and they reduce their capacity to destroy foreign particles like viruses, and viruses can grow very well. 40% decline in viral infections of the lungs are seen in the newborn and later on also in childhood if the mother has a good microbiota to pass over to the fetus. And with this, do we really see this, uh, this um, diagram is adapted from the recent article in the journal Science, and we see 
early life microbiota is seeded seeded by vertical transmission from the maternal microbiota so whatever the mother has goes vertically through the placenta to the fetus and once it reaches the fetus it helps or aids in development of the intestinal mucosal microbiota and this passes over there's a cross talk between the lung development of immunity in response to this microbiota and hence it affects immunity in the offspring critically now this relationship amongst the maternal microbiota early life colonization is uh, immune development continues to co evolve throughout early life for example breastfeeding serves as a continued source of maternal microbes that continuously shape the infant's gut microbiota this clearly justifies the paradigm that you are what your mother eats so the paradigm you are what your mother eat in today's world your immunity is greatly shaped by prebiotics and its positive role in programming the gut microbiota especially from the mother to the baby with this let me pass it on to professor hans from copenhagen to take over from here Thank you so much, Dr. Raba. Uh, and over to you, Dr. Hans. I think you have to share your screen for Professor Hans because I have stopped sharing my screen now. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, he will share his. Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Hans, you can take the control and share your screen. And uh, sir, you might have to remove the mute because we can't hear you very clearly. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Can you see no, the screen? No, not yet. Yet, waiting to see it, sir. You see the screen? Not yet, sir. Yes, sir. You can see that. You can see the screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So I have an audience. Do I have an audience? Yes, sir. You do. You okay. Do. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you to my good colleagues in India. I uh, must say I would have preferred to visit you and see you face to face. Now I'm looking into a screen. I actually don't know if you've left when you saw a Viking on the, your screen. I hope you're out there. Um, I am pleased to present to you what is the most important study that I have completed in my 40 years of research into childhood asthma. The study is, a, uh, for me, a landmark prospective study we've conducted in our research clinic. It's a clinic of between 40 and 50 researchers dedicated to the uh, study of, of uh, mother-child cohorts. We have two cohorts. The second one, we started in 2010, and this is the one where we performed a randomized control trial of fish oil. Fish oil was compared to olive oil. We randomized 736 pregnant mother at week 24, and we followed them and their kid until the kids were three when we broke the code and then for another three years uh, for clinical follow-up. And actually we're still following at the moment having a 10 year follow-up. The essence of our research is a very dedicated uh, clinical um, observation. They come to our research clinic. They don't go to other doctors uh, to avoid the heterogeneity between doctors in our country at least. So we, we see them um, often. Uh, I believe we've seen them 14 times by now. And uh, it's, it's, it's the essence to understand the, the, the results that this is a very deep phenotyping. So it was a single, or it is a single center uh, study. Uh, it's placebo controlled, it's parallel group with, with um, pregnant women being randomized to fish oil four grams a day or, or uh, olive oil. So it's a one-to-one -one randomization and the primary output the primary endpoint was persistent wheeze or asthma by age three, three and, and um, 
again, at age six, secondary endpoints were respiratory tract infections, uh, eczema, allergic sensitization, um, and gut infections. We uh, ended up with 695 newborns in the study. And the effect was uh, quite dramatic. The overall effect when we looked at everybody in the study was a reduction of asthma by 30%. But we saw that the whole effect was driven by the women with the lowest um, blood level of fish oil, meaning the lowest intake of fish oil. You see on the screen to your right, the higher tertile in the middle, the middle tertile, and to your left, you have the women with the lower tertile level of EPA and DHA in the blood. And as you see, the whole effect is driven by those with a low intake, a low blood level. So in this group, we actually saw the overall effect, as I said, was 30%. And in the high risk with low concentration, it was a 50% reduction in childhood asthma. Moreover, we saw a reduction in uh, lung infections by approximately one third. And um, as a very recent result, we have also, we've now looked at gastroenteritis and we see the same size of effect with a reduction of one third in gastroenteritis in the first three years of life. We also looked at the neurological development of the children. We looked at um, milestones, language development. And by age two and a half, we, did a, we performed a Bailey test to uh, assess the IQ. And uh, finally, we did a, a strength and difficulty interview by age six. And all of them were improved by the fish oil. In particular, the uh, IQ test by two and a half showed an effect of gaining two points with the boys in the boys nothing in the girls, but two points meant that boys were suddenly equally smart to girls. We all know that boys are not as smart as girls. Uh, we catch up later, but in the young child, the uh, girls are smarter. But if we had fish oil, we would have been equally smart. So this is, as I said, the, the, uh, one of the other endpoints, the important one with a hazard ratio of 0.77, meaning uh, a significant, uh, a meaning a meaningful reduction in airway infections. Um, another finding was that the gestational age was increased by two days and the size for gestational age was also increased. And furthermore, by age six, the children who had had fish oil during pregnancy were 0.4 kilo bigger, 0.4 kilo larger if they had received fish oil. As the BMI was significantly increased, so we were very worried when we got the data, but fortunately we had also completed a DEXA scan. And when we looked at the DEXA scan, we saw the lean mass, the graph to your left, there was a right-sided distribution from fish oil likewise from the bone mass, uh, but not significantly from the fat mass. So the BMI was actually an increase in bone and lean mass. So you get 0.4 kilo more child by age six, not fat, but lean mass and bone mass. As it repeats here on the slide, it's a proportional increase in, in all three compartments and not a, a, they don't get more fat. Here we have the data from the, um, from the cognitive test, the Bailey score. You see the, uh, on your right, you see the fish oil uh, dark shaded and to your and the pink placebo. So there is an overall right distribution or a distribution move to the right. And this is uh, for the boys as mentioned. All in all, I, I hope this is convincing evidence to show you that there is a very significant beneficial effect from fish oil during pregnancy for the asthma prevalence, but also in other organs. As a matter of fact, to me as a scientist, it is probably some of the more interesting findings that there is a multi-organ effect. Independent organs as the brain, the neurodevelopment, the asthma, 
the lung infection, the gastroenteritis, the growth, the, 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 gastro, the uh, gestational age, all different organs are affected by this obviously essential fish oil. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hans. That was an impressive presentation. And, uh, and uh, to add uh, that uh, this, these studies have been being published in one of the most eminent journals in, uh, in the publication uh, space and in the medical science. And uh, they have also been, Dr. Hans has also been an, a figure who has been uh, on the news and also on TV channels across the world uh, explaining and uh, discussing about this wonderful study that he's been doing at his center. So uh, Dr. Hans, uh, we would like to go ahead with the question for you. Um, since, uh, since Dr. Hans is joining from the other part of the world, he would possibly like to leave after, uh, after his session. Uh, so Dr. Hans, a uh, question for you would be, uh, COPSAC research is so meticulous and exhaustive and it clearly demonstrates the critical importance of PUFA supplementation in the pregnant mother after 20 weeks. But why stop after the baby is born? And wouldn't it be equally important for the infant and children? A very good question. I mean, um, the logic seems to suggest if uh, fish oil is important until the day you were born, probably also after. I would be surprised if the effect of fish oil supplementation would stop the day you were born. Therefore, we're currently planning a new randomized controlled trial where we give the fish oil uh, from birth as it may probably continue improving health of the young child. Thank you so much, doctor. And and um, if if you um, if you would like to leave, and if, if that is if, if you'd like to continue on the webinar, that would be a pleasure. But if in case it, it is uh, in, imperative for you to leave the webinar, that's fine, and I will continue with the next speaker and the next session. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. Uh, you might have to just stop sharing your screen, sir, and I can pass on the controls to myself. Just give me a second. Yes, Dr. Minu, uh, you can take it ahead, ma'am. Uh, so passing it on to Dr. Uh -huh. Professor Minu Singh. I'll handle the slides, ma'am. So you just have to indicate to me next slide and I will do that for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rasika. And uh, Good evening, all my friends who have joined for the webinar today. Uh, it was quite a treat to listen to Hans Viscard again. I have listened to him in several forums earlier and uh, I've had the opportunity to visit COPSEC Center in Denmark and uh, really impressive study site where so many facilities are available for follow-up of this cohort, which has been so diligently been uh, recruited. And with Dr. Han's help, we are also trying to set up a cohort like this in PGI Chandigarh. Uh, but my topic for today is hyperinflammatory response in COVID and role of resolvents. Now, you might be wondering why this has come into this PUFA seminar. Uh, basically, as you can see it on your slide, the next slide, please. Jessica, can you show the next slide, please? Yes. You know, in this COVID pandemic, every passing day, a new learning is happening. And COVID-19 is masquerading as a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. I, being a pediatrician, always wondered why children are being spared or it looked as if COVID was a bit generous to children because less children are getting affected. But then there were reports of uh, children who were affected in New York, in England. And there was a New York Times news about state of 
fire in his veins, teen battles new COVID syndrome. And this condition, which the CDC uh, thought and called as multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, has actually shaken this widespread confidence that children were largely being spared from the pandemic. And this was seen that instead of targeting lungs, the primary coronavirus infection, as the infection does, it caused inflammation throughout the body and it could cripple the heart and it could actually paralyze the immune system. It has been compared to a rare childhood inflammatory disease called Kawasaki disease, which originated, uh, which has been reported first from Japan, but a large number of cases have been reported from India. Uh, but the doctors have learned that the new syndrome affects the heart differently and erupts mostly in the school age children rather than infants and toddlers. The syndrome often appears weeks after infection in children who did not experience the first phase coronavirus symptoms. Next one, please. Now the hyperinflammatory syndrome in COVID, it can extend to various organs of the body and the organs which are affected could be the circulatory system and that means heart, the, and that affects the kidneys, the body goes into shock, there is a cytokine storm. And there have been some peculiar findings seen in these children like what are being called as COVID dose, as you can see in this picture, uh, where there is inflammation which develops in the toes of uh, these children and also the hands get inflamed. And that is what mostly what we see in Kawasaki disease. But then there are other features in Kawasaki disease which are there. Next one, please. So this severe COVID-19, which is a life-threatening condition, it produces a severe hyperimmune response in the lungs and a systemic inflammatory response also is there. And this is characterized by pulmonary hyperinflammation and there is endogenous lipid autocoid production, mediators which are there, like eicosanoids, which play a critical role in the induction of inflammation and pro-inflammatory cytokine production. So there are several uh, things which are happening in these patients. And uh, many of these patients would actually end up having shock and uh, the ones who ultimately pass away they develop ARDS, which may be there because of shock. And that now I'm talking of the disease, which occurs in adults as well. And now, you know, as the number of confirmed cases of COVID has approached about 2.5 million and more than 1.6 uh, thousand deaths, I mean, uh, more than 166,000 deaths, which have occurred, the clinicians and pathologists are really struggling to understand the damage which it brings about in the body. And they are realizing that although the lungs are the ground zero, but the disease affects the heart, the blood vessels, the kidneys, the gut, and the brain. And this cytokine storm which occurs in these patients, it's very important to control the local and systemic inflammatory response which happens, uh, which may happen with, because of antiviral therapies or the control would have to be done with certain other agents, which are now being considered to be an important tool in control of this hyperinflammatory response. Next slide, please. So stimulation of inflammatory resolution is a novel post-focused alternative to complement current therapies. The loss of active resolution mechanism in these patients, which occurs, and dysregulation of uh, these specialized pro-resolving molecules and mediators in sustained pathological models are now causing, uh, the ones which are causing lung disease present a new opportunity for the management of COVID-19 patients. These pro-resolving mediators can actually help fight the fatal cytokine storm 
which occurs in these patients. And hence, this is, uh, this is where the role of uh, PUFA comes in because PUFA leads to production of many of these agents, which would ultimately control the in hyperinflammation which is occurring in these patients. And some of these also have antiviral properties as well as they lead to cytokine suppression. Next slide, please. So these resolvents, which are there, this is a potential novel post-centric therapeutic avenue. In it, and there is a paradigm shift now emerging with, with the discovery of resolvents, which may lead to uh, therapeutics in cases of uh, COVID. So these resolvents are arising, they are all coming from lipid molecules. And we have just had a discussion on fish oil and fish oil provides polyunsaturated fatty acids. And these polyunsaturated fatty acids can lead to uh, production of uh, resolvents and other SPMs which stimulate macrophage mediated clearance of debris and counter production of inflammatory cytokines, uh, a process which is known as, uh, you know, inflammation resolution. SPMs and other lipid precursors, which exhibit these properties, and they also have antiviral activity at nanogram doses in the setting of influenza without being immunosuppressive has been observed. And it's also been seen that SPMs also promote anti viral B cell antibodies and lymphocyte activity highlighting their potential use in the you know, event of COVID-19. Now, soluble epoxide hydrolase is an inhibitor which stabilizes arachidonic acid-derived um, epoxy, eicosatrionic acid, it's quite a trunk twister, so I'll call it EETs, which also stimulate information resolution by promoting the production of uh, all these pro-resolution mediators, activating anti-inflammatory processes and preventing the cytokine storm. So resolvents are the key word today if we have to use PUFA uh, or resort to uh, PUFA-induced resolvents uh, in treating COVID-induced inflammation. Uh, next slide, please. So now this is an overview of pathways for synthesis of uh, uh, all these resolvents and uh, other molecules which are uh, which are protect protectins or they could be uh, the other things like marisins which can lead to uh, protection of tissues uh, from the onslaught of the virus. And these mediators such as lipoxin, resolvents, protectins, marisins, are actually produced during the inflammatory response and they derive from polyunsaturated fatty acids. And as we know that fish oil uh, gives us polyunsaturated fatty acids. I was, uh, uh, although, so uh, COPSEC studies have shown that it is the intrauterine administration, that means when the baby is inside, uh, inside the home of the mother, that when they are exhibited to PUFA, they develop uh, you know, a kind of resistance to getting infections as well as allergies. And uh, we did just heard uh, Professor Hans say that we don't really know whether postnatal supplementation of PUFA would have a similar effect. But there are some studies which are on way, even in the COVID uh, times now, to see whether PUFA can give protection because of these mechanisms uh, for uh, this particular disease. And we know that there is no specific therapy which is available for COVID. So it's certainly worth trying and uh, scientifically testing uh, whether PUFA supplementation in these patients could be helpful. We know that our populations could be deficient in PUFA, like uh, several mothers which have been seen who are uh, put on um, supplementation for, with fish oil they would be deficient in PUFA and there the benefit as uh, Professor Discard showed was much more in comparison to the ones who had normal levels. So similar things could be prevailing in uh, normal population of males and females where PUFAs may be low and their ability to 
deal with this hyperimmune response may be impaired uh, because of this deficiency. So one can think of supplementation with polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, for creating a milieu which can uh, tackle this hyperimmune response. Uh, next slide, please. So now these, uh, where do we get them from? We know that the sources for resolvins are bioactive uh, omega-3 PUFAs. And bioactive omega-3 PUFAs are eicosapentaenoic acid, EPAs, and docosahexaenoic acid, DHA, which are poorly synthesized in the humans. And as you know that sometimes the breast milk uh, which contains DHA and when you humanize the milk, you have to add DHA to it. And DHA is something which leads to better brain maturation. But here uh, it would contribute towards uh, production of resolvents. So these are uh, components of seafood, especially oily fish and of fish oil, liver oil. And there are certain algal oil supplements which are available. Uh, these days. Uh, I think that is the end of my slides. Uh, because uh, some of these supplements which are available and uh, we have been finding them to be useful in uh, supplementing our mothers who are deficient in food. Next slide. I think that's, that's all for me. Uh, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Menu. Uh, and now on to our next speaker, we will have uh, Dr. Professor Sunita Mittal, who will be presenting the next lecture on PUFA and pregnancy and the meta-analysis in preterm and, uh, and IUGR. So can we have uh, Professor Sunita Mittal, ma'am? And ma'am, I will be able to coordinate with the slides for you. Ma'am, can you hear <coughs> Okay. Hello, ma'am. Are you able to hear me, ma'am? Uh, hi, Dr. Jay. Uh, yes, Dr. Jay. Yeah, yes, uh, I can see. I can see Dr. Sunita in the attendee side. Can you please? Uh, Give her a presenter access. Yes, ma'am, sure. Yeah. Well, because ma'am has been logged in from two devices, so we need to rectify from one device. Uh, Sunita, ma'am, can you please raise your hand so we can find it? Just give us a few minutes. It's a small technical uh, yeah, issue. Yeah, now it is done. Ma'am, can you hear that now, ma'am? Uh, yes, okay. ma'am. I can take. Can I take up the question if there is time? Uh, this is uh, Dr. Um, Neenu speaking. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You like if there is some time available because. Uh, okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But uh, but if Dr. Mittal is online, then it's fine with me. I can do that later because I want to be there. Uh, Dr. Sunita, ma'am, are you there online, ma'am? Are you ready for the presentation? Yes. Or Okay. Okay. Ma'am, can it can it can we do it later, ma'am? Is it okay, ma'am? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Just give me a couple of minutes, ma'am. I'm just sharing the screen for you to go ahead. Can you see the screen, ma'am? Dr. Sunita?
ma'am. Professor Sunita Mittal, ma'am, are you able to hear us? Hello. Yes, ma'am. I think so. There is a connectivity issue with ma'am. Okay, so what we can do is, uh, uh, in the interest of time, uh, until Dr. Prof uh, Professor Sunita Mittal joins in, I can uh, take up uh, the questions with Dr. Meenu and uh, also can go ahead with the next presentation if that is okay with the panel. Yeah. Just give me one second. Dr. Meenu, ma'am, uh, can yes. you hear me? Yes, 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 ma'am. The, the, the question for you would be uh, in the interest of everyone who's joined in, COVID 19 is baffling us day after day, and we can understand that. And the understanding is still emerging and evolving. Uh, would you like to share the experience of managing COVID at PGI Chandigarh? And secondly, what we witness now with the multi-systemic uh, disorder in children, is this a potential risk for, in, for us in India also with children and adults, ma'am? Yes, uh, I would first give you the experience we have had in PGI. In PGI, we have a 250-bedded uh, facility which was dedicated to admitting COVID patients. And uh, we have treated so far about uh, less than, a little less than 200 patients. And there have been about four deaths. And uh, many of these patients, of course, have had to go for intensive care unit. So actually the pay cases are divided into categories. They're divided into category A, B, C, and D. And category A is something where there is infection, but there are no symptoms and no risk factors. And these patients actually are just given hydroxychloroquine as a, you can say, not as a prophylaxis, but so they're prophylaxis for developing the disease. And that's all. The second category is where the patients have uh, are high risk. For example, if they're diabetics, if they're hypertensive, or if they're frontline workers and they turn out to be positive. In those cases also, we give them hydroxychloroquine plus we monitor them. And we these days we are actually uh, was doing a trial for uh, mycobacterium bolshe, where, uh, you know, which is being tried as an immune potentiator in these patients. Then the category C are the patients who start developing symptoms and the ones who have, in fact, uh, borderline hypoxia, and but they are not yet in the intensive care unit. So these patients actually uh, are being, uh, you know, treated more seriously. They get oxygen, all the supportive therapy. As we know, nothing is uh, sacrosanct that that is going to work in these patients. So supportive care is very important. Their fluids, their diet and uh, other things are important. Uh, but along with that, drugs like rutinavir and uh, uh, some of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, antibodies are being tried in these patients. Even plasma exchange actually has been done in some of these patients. And the ones which are category D, which are very severe, which are in an intensive care unit, intubated on, uh, if they have ARDS-like features, uh, they are being treated like in a standard way which are for intensive care patients. And uh, they're also given all these therapies which are now becoming available. All new therapies actually are being tried these days. So this is how we are managing these patients. As far as children are concerned, we've had four children, but, and two of them have died actually. But they, that is all because of their comorbidities. One was a child with a heart disease, was a congenital heart disease, was going to be operated, but then turned out to be COVID positive. And this patient died uh, of heart failure. Uh, there was another child who had hepatic encephalopathy who has uh, died, who's also was uh, COVID positive, and he died because of hepatic encephalopathy. The other two patients are okay, yeah, he survived. So we have not yet seen uh, the Kawasaki-like syndrome 
uh, in our patients. Although our center kind of reports Kawasaki disease quite a lot, so they are quite uh, used to seeing these patients. But we are not very sure whether they are exactly like Kawasaki because in Kawasaki they have involvement of the coronary arteries. So we have not yet seen these vasculitic like presentation of these patients, but. Uh, you know, you have to be ready for all kind of emergencies and all kind of possibilities, which may be there as the infection rates are rising, uh, we may get to see these patients. But so far, uh, for children, uh, there have not been so many cases. So that's what we are looking for. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for answering that in so much detail. And uh, again, it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Sunita Mittal connected um, ma'am, the, the, I'm sorry for the technical uh, glitch that is there, but I think that has only increased the anticipation of your lecture here. So uh, I will be sharing the screen quickly. And uh, ma'am, let me know if you can uh, see the screen. And ma'am, it's over to you. You can continue. I can handle the slide. So let me know uh, when I have to shift from one slide to the other. Ha, but I at the moment, I cannot see anything on the screen. So now can you see, ma'am? No, not yet. Neither the slides nor the videos. Jay, is there an issue? Can we sort this? Or I can ask ma'am to open the slides from her side and I can, so that she can speak from her slides on her panel? Yes, yes, ma'am. I don't think, uh, because then I'll have to log out of this and then open the slides. I didn't load okay. them. I thought we'll be running them. So. Uh, but ma'am, you can't, you're not unable to see it uh, now also? I am not able to see anything except word Zoom written there. And I think everybody else can also see only that. Oh. No, actually we can I see the doubt. screen. We can see, I think ma'am, if you, you see the click screen? on, yeah, if you click on the, uh, you know, uh, at the base, uh -huh. maybe you uh, change the Click on where? Yeah. Um, can you see, see a small blue color uh, uh, yeah. blue kind of a thing below in your screen? Um, or if you can download this uh, Zoom itself, is, there, is it asking you to... Zoom is on my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Huh. Is there an icon of Zoom below on the lower part of your screen, which is a blue video camera kind of thing? Blue, yes. yes ma'am. Can you click that, ma'am? I ma clicked on that, yes. Now, can you see my screen, ma'am? Uh, let me see. No, it was earlier very nicely visible. Now, nothing is visible. Um, have you opened the Zoom application? Yes. I, maybe I reopen it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm able to see, ma'am? Can I re go to the link again? Uh, maybe. No problem, ma'am. Ma'am, can you see it now, ma'am? Uh, no, I think so. Sunita ma'am has left the meeting. Oh, okay. So, um, I think, Jay, uh, what I will do is uh, I will continue it and I will um, uh, get, uh, I will maybe ask the question to Dr. Abha and then uh, take on Dr. Ruma's, uh, ma'am's presentation also. And then uh, when Dr. Sunita Mittal comes in again, I would like to ask her question, uh, ask her, uh, her to present her. Yes, ma'am, sure, definitely, okay. definitely. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Abha, would it be okay if I can, uh, if you could take up your question now, ma'am? Then is ma'am hearing me? Uh, Dr. Jay, hi, this, this is Monica. This said, I can see Dr. Abha under attendee. Yeah, uh, I have done, done. 
Okay, thanks. Dr. Abhaman? Can you see me? Uh, can we see her, uh, Jay? Can you see her? Can you hear me, can you hear me Rasika? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I can yes, very clearly hear you, ma'am. Okay, uh, and can you see me also? I can. Yes, ma'am. We can clearly see you, ma'am. So you ask the question and let me do with the question whatever is there. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am. thank you so much, ma'am. We realized yesterday, I, I know before the webinar when we were trying to connect with you, you were still working and in the in the OT at that point of time, and uh, and th this is tremendous effort from uh, from your side, ma'am. And thank you so much for being on the panel again today. Uh, so, ma'am, there are about like you said, uh, there were about five thousand different papers that have been published since two thousand ten on the increasing evidence around gut microbiome and the and and it in modulating the immunity. What would be your comments with regard to maternal influences on fetal microbiome development? See, Rasika, while evidence is accumulating that microbial programming begins in utero and is probably the main component for the development of a balanced mucosal immune system in the newborn, we still need more knowledge in this area, which would guide future clinical trials and maybe manipulating maternal diet could be a possible strategy to prevent not only adverse pregnancy outcomes like preterm birth or birth weight, but also aid the development of a healthy microbiome in the offspring and thus better development of the immune system. Use of PUFA in pregnant women has been done with the aim of supporting the development of fetal microbiome in preventing diseases like cognitive function becomes better or maybe respiratory infection reduces by its anti-inflammatory action. So it is it strengthens the fetal respiratory immune system. This is now being tried in clinical practice following publication of several research papers. So I feel that it does develop in the fetus the uh, fetal microbiome development happens in response to maternal diet. And a good maternal diet would lead to a good fetal microbiome development, whereas a poor diet would lead to a poor uh, fetal microbiome development. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for that, for, the, for your response. And now if we have to continue uh, with our webinar, thank you so much for, uh, for listening on to us uh, participants who have been logged in. Uh, I would like to take it to the next lecture uh, presentation, which will be by Dr. Ruma Sinha. Ma'am, again, um, welcome and my pleasure to, uh, to have you here on the panel. Ma'am, can you continue with your presentation? I can change the slides for you. Thank you, Rasika. Am I audible to everybody? Am I audible to everybody? Yes, Dr. Ruma, very well. Great. It is great connecting with Dr. Abha, Dr. Meenu, and unfortunately, we have not yet managed to hear Dr. Sunita. And um, excellent um, kind of discussion here with Dr. Hans. Um, I'm really thankful for the uh, for uh, the organizing uh, team, especially Joe and the other people, of including me in this very, very interesting um, topic to be discussed this evening. Uh, this, I think when we are starting this meeting, we are talking about a preventive strategy here. We are not talking about a therapeutic strategy where we are trying to uh, treat a disease, but we are talking about a preventive strategy. And that's, that's really the, the, I think, the next go in medical uh, science and how we treat our patients. So uh, we understood by the previous panels. Uh, speakers that uh, the PUFA or DHA or the e EPA is important for various development. And we have today concentrated only on pregnancy and the effect on the fetus. But if you go to the literature and actually look into it, the, it has effect on everything like heart disease to cancer management and so many things. So it's actually really an overall preventive management for health strategy in our uh, population. Can I have the next slide? So when we understand that uh, DHA or EPA or PUFA is important, how do we get it? Now, we understood that the DHA and EPA are actually not generated in our body. We don't have them. Um, so we need to get it from somewhere. So that, that dietary source becomes the most important factor. 
Uh, in the dietary source, again, we have to understand that we can have either a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian source. Whenever we talk about essential fatty acids, the first thing that comes to our mind is the non-vegetarian diet, and especially the fatty food like salmon or mackerel or things like that. But we must understand that ALA is also a very important factor and very important part of the whole uh, armamentarium in which we are talking about essential fatty acids. Now, ALA is actually abundantly available in vegetarian um, meal, and of which you can see that flax seeds, soya bean, you know, beans, and even green vegetables and things like that have quite an amount of ALA. The ALA can get converted into some part in DHA and EPA, the other three omega-3 fatty acids in our body, not very efficiently, but in, in some parts. So it is not that we cannot get DHA and EPA from a vegetarian diet at all. So can we have the next slide, please? Right. So in order to have the optimal amount of these essential fatty acids, uh, this picture actually speaks, it's a picture of a thousand words, and you can understand that to be able to get the correct bioavailable optimum dose, you either need to eat, eat half a pound of salmon every day or keep 12 hour large fish oil or maybe 1.2 grams of walnut and things like that. So th these are very, very important uh, factor which we need to understand that how much will we consume to get the right amount of optimal dose. So next slides, please. So that is where the technology comes in. So what we have now understood that in case we need to have larger dose of optimal intake of these essential fatty acids, we could actually package it well so that there is good absorption and there is, we can give it better to the patient so that their absorption is better. So what, has, what works here is the microencapsulation and emulsification of the essential fatty acids. Now this is surrounded in something which is like a yogurt, but not really a yogurt. And that coating, which is an emulsified way, actually bypasses the first effect. So first uh, pass effect. So nothing gets destroyed or lost in when it as it passes through the first, first uh, through the liver, and then these particles actually slow down its movement via the small intestine. So what does that happen? So it, there's ample time for it to get absorbed into the bloodstream. So the slow movement adds to this, and therefore they are much more bioavailable. In fact, they are almost 300 time, thousand, uh, percent time more bioavailable than if you take the fish oil in soft gel capsule. So that's what the technology is being talking about. So this dispersion of the uh, and emulsification actually helps one to bioabsorb this uh, essential fatty acids much better. Next, please. Okay, so you, most of us, and I think Dr. Minu mentioned that uh, most, many women are deficient in uh, essential fatty acids or PUFA when we saw. So we could actually even check the omega index, omega-3 index, and see whether you are really deficient. However, most Indian diet is not non-vegetarian. Even if there is non-vegetarian, we must understand that in Indian diet, the amount of non-vegetarian that we eat is not so much. So it is not that a half a pound of salmon you're going to eat. You may eat one piece and that's not really going to add to too much of. So supplement becomes an important source for bioavailable DHA and EPA, and of course also ALA, for do, for do all the benefits that my previous speakers have already spoken. So I think I will stop here and see if we have any questions from the audience or we have any discussion amongst our panelists. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Very sorry, very sorry. Ma'am, uh, Dr. Ruma, the question for you reads, uh, PUFA and diet, since you spoke about it, ma'am, how sufficient would the Indian diet make us? And what is your advice for pregnant women uh, who have insufficient levels of PUFA in pregnancy? Can you hear me, ma'am? Was I clear? Ma'am, you're also on mute, ma'am. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, it's great to see Professor Mittal on the screen. I don't know whether she can hear me. 
Anyhow. Yes, I can uh, hear you. Uh, hello. I am yeah. Good, good. Uh, I am good. Uh, okay, great. I just answer one question and then we'll listen to you. Uh, mm -hmm. See, it's very important to talk about diet and I think it's just not related to PUFA or anything. Diet is what we are. So we have to understand that. Primarily, Indians are more or less vegetarian people. We are not a very... Um, Big intake. No, I can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Non-vegetarian food, especially sea food and sea uh, um, uh, fish. So we have to understand that yes, Indian diet and vegetarian diet is rich. So it's something like nuts, like walnuts, flaxseed, and especially to understand the ground flaxseed and not the whole flaxseed because the whole flaxseed is not easily digestible. So you need to have the ground flaxseed, walnuts, green vegetables. You know, these are some of the things which are actually rich. Even soya bean is rich. So I would think that if you have to give a suggestion to my pregnant patients, I would say maybe they should increase these dietary factors because just supplements is always not the right approach. But if I feel that their diet is not sufficient, they are they are in their omega-3 index very low, that obviously. So I understand that their good omega level will give benefit to their newborn fetuses. Then I would definitely suggest that. However, there are many trials in pregnant women, as Dr. Hans has explained and uh, discussed. But there are other trials also, which have actually talked about uh, the benefit of these, these in various other uh, scenarios like you have the vital trial, the reduce it trial, especially they were looking into the benefit of these PUFA in heart disease. Some, <laughs> benefit, some didn't show benefit. Very high dose of supplement also can be of problem. So that also should be kept in mind. So we must encourage our patients not to uh, take very high supplement unless the doctor has advice. So we should be able to figure that out. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your response. Now. Uh, the much-awaited presentation uh, by Dr. Sunita Mittal, ma'am. I will be quickly sharing the screen, ma'am, and uh, we'll also navigate the presentation for you. Yes, thank you. Just give me two minutes, ma'am. Can you see the screen, ma'am? Yes, I can see Over this. To Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rasika. And... Of course, good evening to all my expert colleagues and good morning and good afternoon who are joining from the other part of the world. It's been very nice. In yeah, fact, it's good. there was some technical problem, so I'm now coming in the Just end. Like this. Yeah. I think, ma'am, you take off your earphone. Uh, hmm? I, what do I do? Good evening, ma'am. Just take off your earphones. Don't use your earphones. Okay. Remove Fine. your you earphones. Are able to, you are able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. We are able to hear Better you. Better hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. And you can see me also? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let me begin. In any case, yeah, we have better. already heard very good things about this. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Are you able to hear me now? Hmm. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Ma. Thank you so much once again. A very good evening. Yes. Yes. Ma'am, go ahead, ma'am. Sumita, ma'am, can you listen to me? Yes, I am Con able to hear. Uh, continue, ma'am. Uh -huh. We can hear you very clearly, ma'am. Can you see my uh, slide, ma'am? Uh, uh... Okay, Rasika, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Very clearly, uh -huh. ma'am. Very clearly. You just have very to clearly. Continue, So, yes, thanks to Dr. Hans, Dr. Jofen, and all other colleagues, yes. Okay, okay. I can see the slide. Huh. Yeah. So oh, we have already heard about the role of PUFA, the types of PUFA, how it does influence. Hello. 
शहाज फिर चली गई मैम के जय इज देर एनी इशू विद दैट वन और uh ma'am but what we we can hear you very clearly ma'am so you can continue ma'am we are not hearing two sounds uh, so you can go ahead with the presentation ma'am uh, rashika ma'am i think so ma'am has left the meeting again because there is a net uh, net, it, a net issue at her place so that's okay. why she is not able to join perfectly okay so uh if there are any questions from the audience can we take it jay can you project that for me yes yes no problem uh, let me just see if there are any questions at the other end i'm not able i'm not really seeing any of the other questions that have come up uh, are there anything on the chat that is there no ma'am not yet okay so thank you so much ma'am the uh, only thing we are running out of our time because uh, the, the webinar was from 7 to 8 and i can understand i probably have the question that is for dr sunita mittal and uh, i would like to know if any of the panelists so do we leave do we leave the meeting Ma'am, uh, there's this just oh. one more question. Uh, if I could just pose it to the uh, the panel, and if anybody would like to answer it, it just is uh, that the preterm delivery and IUGR is of great concern, particularly with previous history, and what we know from large meta analysis with vast experience dealing with uh, high risk pregnancies. Uh, how would we recommend PUFA in antenatal practice? Ma'am, any one of the panelists who would like to take up this question can answer the question. Doctor Abba, would you like to take it up? Ma'am, Doctor Ruma had given an opinion. Rasika, can we leave the meeting? Rasika, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma can we leave the meeting? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, it's okay, ma'am. Yeah, I think it's it's time up, and we are close. I could not hear the question. Sorry. Oh, okay, ma'am. Uh, can you hear it now, ma'am? Am I clear? Yeah. Yes. Ma'am, yes. uh, ma'am, with the uh, pre-term. Yeah. preterm delivery and iugr uh, with with particularly with previous history uh, we know from uh, large meta analysis that they are all high risk pregnancies so in I that can't, so, yeah, your question cannot be heard okay because it is cutting off okay sorry ma'am uh, dr roma can you hear me yes i can yeah, can you can you just take that question ma'am uh, would it be important at least in certain high risk pregnancies that we think uh, and in case of uh, history with uh, children in asthma as a family history do you think uh, a recommendation of pufa after checking the levels need to be recommended in antenatal practice uh, yes i think yeah yeah i think the uh, discussion in the panel has already made it very clear that uh, correct supplementation of pufa in antenatal mothers have made a difference Uh, according to a long term prospective trial that dr hans discussed that they have been following children up to 3 to 5 years post delivery they have found that uh, mothers who had adequate amount of pufa um, the children did not have the development of these allergies so i think it may be made sense where we have high risk patients especially if some we have some patients where they have the radiopathic pre term delivery we are just not able to put our finger where it is maybe those are the cases where we could try pufa and see whether that made a difference yes So thank you so much. I think we've come to the end of our webinar. I'm really sorry we are missing Dr. Sunita Mittal's presentation, but it we are off time and and it's been really difficult to connect with her. But uh, thank you so much, panelists, for joining and taking your time for for discussing this important thing. And I'm sure the participants on the other side have benefited much more than what I have. And I'm I'm really thank you so much and have a very good evening and a good night, ma'am. Thank you so much. Bye. See you, ma'am. Bye. Bye.
हेलो सर एंड कर दो यस 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 